All right, I think we're ready to go. So just give it one second and so I can mute the other page before it uh, gets going. All right, done redirecting to Facebook. Oh, really quickly here, videos. Just so I can get the comment section. And then as we go along, we'll have comments come in that we can have uh, people chime in and, and just ask questions about what's going on. Okie dokie. Well, uh, welcome everybody tuning in. Thank you all for, for tuning in for another installment of the hashtag together at home webinar series from Buffet Crampon USA. Uh, if you're tuning into this series for the first time, my name is Declan Lynch and I am the low brass product specialist for Buffet Crampon. And just a quick reminder that this series is broadcast every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And this coming Tuesday will be uh, a discussion of playing from a new perspective, which will be broadcast on the Powell Flutes page, hosted by my fantastic colleague, Kristen Moore, uh, who is our direct sales and artist relations specialist for Powell Flutes. So please tune in uh, into that as I'm sure we'll be packed with a ton of really cool information. Uh, and as you can see, I am clearly not alone for this week's episode. Um, I am joined by, by Denson Paul Pollard of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, um, so thank you so much for being here today. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite and uh, shout out to Indiana University as well. I should say the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. I'm uh, uh, also uh, one of the uh, trombone professors there. Um, I'm currently in Bloomington, Indiana, riding out the viral world storm. <laughs> so glad to be here. Good to see you, Declan. Good to see you too. Um, so today's topic is a very exciting one, as we will not only be discussing uh, uh, his career, but also discussing the Anton Courtois uh, creation New York series bass trombone. Um, so it, we have a lot to get through, but um, uh, despite everything going on, and I, I wish we could be doing these under better circumstances, but uh, as you said, through this, this crazy time, how have you been, been keeping busy? That's, it. That's the question of the day, isn't it? Uh... <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a very strange few months for all of us. For me, um, I, I've been telling people I was going 200 miles an hour and suddenly went to zero, really, because mm -hmm. I've spent the last two years teaching in Bloomington, Indiana, and playing in New York, which meant uh, – many flights back and forth every week in a schedule that required that I be very organized and didn't have a lot of downtown, didn't have a lot of free time and uh, to suddenly uh, nothing really. So it's been refreshing, honestly. Uh, number one, I'm spending a lot of time with my family. I've got two children, uh, 15, 17. So we've been doing a lot of stuff there. Uh, lots of, uh, gardening and some fishing and some uh, different house projects here and there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've also been practicing in a way that has not been possible for many years for me uh, uh, with this newfound free time. I'm, you know, making sure that I get in a, a warm up that is complete and uh, efficient every day. And I'm practicing unaccompanied solos uh, quite a bit uh, earlier in the, I guess it was probably a month ago now or something like that. I did a solo recital for Buffet Crampon Paris and uh, that was, uh, that was fun to prepare, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot. I'm staying very busy actually. That's awesome. And uh, that, that, that bit about practicing, that seems to be pretty, pretty synonymous with a lot, with a lot of, a lot of musicians are, are saying right now is that, Although this is so stressful, we, we have the time now to, to be able to practice and, and do some of those other things that we wanted to do. And uh, as he just mentioned, uh, his, his recital that he did for the, the Paris showroom is, is still available on Facebook. And I, I definitely encourage you to check it out. It was phenomenal to listen to. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, so uh, you mentioned going back and forth. Uh, has your teaching schedule been, been a lot of online like most people or has it been kind of stagnant? Yeah, the Jacobs School of Music uh, went to 100% online teaching like, like the rest of the world did uh, a few months back. And uh, I was fortunate a lot of uh, uh, with my, my studio at the Jacobs School of Music, we had, we had completed a lot of what we planned to do for the semester. Our studio recital was completed. We did a great studio recital where every, every player played an opera aria. Uh, 
yeah, so on bass trombone. Uh, it was so it was a recital of some of the greatest hits of uh, the opera uh, song repertoire played on bass trombone. So my students got a lot out of that. We completed that. Had several students do solo recitals as well. That was all finished before this started happening. And it was right before spring break uh, at, at Jacobs. So uh, we basically did not, uh, we, we did not continue with face-to-face -face teaching after spring break. And that was kind of unfortunate. Uh, usually what I do in the spring semester after spring break is we focus on contrabass trombone. We, yeah. have, we have two contrabass trombones in my studio. By the way, uh, my, st my teaching situation at Jacobs is unique in that uh, I only teach bass trombone. I'm the bass trombone teacher at Jacobs. So I have a studio of uh, all bass trombone players. And so again, after spring break, we were going to focus on contra bass trombone and everybody was going to, everybody was going to get some time on our instruments. We have two in my studio and a third, if you count my personal bass trombone, contra bass trombone, excuse me. But uh, yeah, we had, we had most, most everything done except for the contra bass work that uh, we were going to do, which we weren't able to, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, online teaching, a lot of that uh, and uh, lots of random lessons from people around the world. You know, even though this is, this, uh, these circumstances are not great, you know, some really interesting things have developed as a result of this. You know, the whole Zoom teaching phenomena is, is really amazing, you know, because with this technology and during this time, anybody can have a lesson with anybody else anywhere in the world. And it's just that's that's an ama that's that's amazing, you know. You can uh, somebody from the the farthest island on the other side of the world uh, can meet with somebody in New York or from any other place in the world and and have a meaningful experience. And you know, it, it's incredible, really. So I've been doing a lot of that. I've taught in a lot of different. I've taught a lot of different classes in a lot of different places. That's awesome. That's so cool. And and. It, you know, I've seen so many people online just advertising that and it's such a unique opportunity, as you said, to be able to get lessons from virtually anybody at any time, anywhere. Um, it's a really cool opportunity. Um, but kind of kind of going back in time a little bit. Um, how did you get your start in, in uh, trombone playing and, or more specifically bass trombone playing? <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm originally from a, a, a little town in Georgia and uh, where uh, a the school music program was was really the outlet for anybody that wanted to play music, and so I got my start like most most uh, trombone players from Georgia in in band in uh, fifth grade, and chose the trombone, um, and it, it it was an interesting moment because at that time in my life I was ten years old, fifth grade, and I was pretty involved with uh, little league baseball. Little League football, basketball, was pretty involved with sports and had not given joining band any thought. <laughs> and uh, I showed up to school one day and a buddy of mine, we, we, we walked into the school and there was a big sign that says band instrument trial day. And I thought, whoa, that's kind of weird. I'm not going to do that. No way. And my buddy convinced me to just go give it a shot because he was interested in what was going on. So we walked into the room and it was... Uh, it was a band director and a representative from the local music store with every kind of musical instrument uh, that you could you could play in the band. And we walked around and tried all of the instruments. And I got to the trombone, and of course, the trombone is very unique with a slide. And I thought, wow, that's that's a really cool sound, and uh, this looks like it'd be kind of fun. So I joined up. I joined the band, and uh, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. But it's 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 very interesting that. Uh, uh, another decision in that that split second in my life would have caused the the trajectory of my life to be very different. But uh, yeah, I started I started in high school band uh, and sorry junior high school band was very involved in high school band uh, and honestly coming out of high school the only thing I wanted to do and the only thing I thought about doing was becoming a band director. And so uh, I uh, I applied to one school a little school kind of near where I grew up that every, but every kid that wanted a music ed degree went to this school in from my area. Uh, and it was right over the border in Alabama, Jacksonville state university. And uh, I went there as a music ed major. And by the way, had never had a trombone lesson up to that point. Um, uh, 
there wasn't really a trombone player in the town where I grew up. I had very good band directors who were very knowledgeable. And they taught me taught me well, but I'd never had a, a I'd never been in the presence of someone that was a professional or semi professional trombone player. And it was at that school, Jacksonville State University, as a music ed major, that I started having lessons with a trombone player, a guy that uh, I owe a lot to. Uh, Dr. Jim Roberts was the teacher there. And uh, this little school was very interesting. Uh, it, uh, it had a faculty, the music school had a faculty comprised of, of uh, people from a lot of other parts of the United States that had gone to big schools and... Uh, that were there after most of them were, were teaching at this school after serving in a military band during the Vietnam era. And so they were all very knowledgeable. And my teacher, Jim Roberts was from Massachusetts uh, and uh, had, had a doctor from university of Iowa and was very knowledgeable about all things music and introduced me to orchestral excerpts and uh, introduced me to a proper way to practice. And uh, you know, even though I wanted to be a band director, you know, uh, some playing opportunities came my way and some auditions worked out. And again, the trajectory was very different from what I thought it was going to be. That's very cool. Um, and, and as you mentioned, the, the trajectory there is just so, is so incredibly, th those small moments in time that we look back on are, are really cool to, to look at. And just uh, a couple people chiming in here to say hello. Uh, Lori Orr from New York City and, and Chris Coppinger as well from Long Island chiming in to say hey. Uh, Donnie Todd, our, our Southeast Division Manager and Matt Vance, who is our Woodwind Product Specialist. And as well as Francois Clock uh, saying hello to both of us. So hello everybody and uh, everybody please continue to, to chime in with questions if you have them. Uh, we'll be trying our best to answer anything you, you may wanna uh, ask about. So please continue to chime in. Um, so going from there, when did you, uh, when did you kind of get your, your, when was your first introduction to Courtois? Well, that's another very interesting story. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's many years after the, the music ed part of my life, uh, I landed, uh, my dream job, really, um, a dream job in New York with the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, a, a few years after getting to New York, uh, uh, Courtois decided to open up a, a showroom there. And uh, as a part of that, they had uh, they had a big uh, uh, cattle call uh, meeting with a lot of trombone players in New York City, where they had all of their instruments there, and uh, you could basically go and and try try their instruments and. So I, I went, you know, I was there with the, our principal trombonist, David Langlitz at the time, uh, who kind of told me about it. And uh, my colleague Weston Sprott was there also. And uh, we showed up and I, I think the person that had your job two people ago, uh, who was that? What was that guy's name? Uh, Tim Ornato? No, it was before Tim. Trumpet player. Oh, gosh. I oh, um, I, I, yeah. Oh gosh, no, no, I'm blanking on this. Um, I, uh, I've got COVID brain, but he, <laughs> he, he was there. He gave a speech about what uh, what uh, what the plans were with the showroom, and he said, "Okay, here are the instruments. Anybody wants to try an instrument, uh, go for it." And so, uh, you know, I I tried their bass trombone, and uh, at that time, at that time, the company really did not have an instrument that was designed for the. Um, the, the American market, the Western market, the, the um, American aesthetic, the, with the, uh, able to pr produce a sound that was going to be successful in the American market. And so I, I took the bass from own, I practiced a little bit and, you know, it was just apparent it was not going to work for what I needed to do. And, uh, I think it was France. I think it was Francois that called and said, well, Hey, what do you think about the instrument? And, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful, and I, I, uh, I was thankful for the opportunity to try it. But I just said, "Hey, you know, thanks for letting me try it, but it's, I don't think it's going to work for my for my job situation." And Francois was so uh, forward thinking and so uh, open to the idea of changing the instrument. I had no idea that it was going to lead to this, honestly. Uh, and so he said, "So uh, what? Don't you tell me the things you don't like about it? T tell me the things that need to be different." And 
he said, the next time I'm in New York, let's meet. And so uh, at that time, the, the showroom was uh, very near, as it is now, uh, very near the Landris, uh, Landris shop in New York, uh, the repair shop. And so I met Francois at, at Landris, Josh Landris' shop. And he said, okay, Josh, I want to reserve your time. And so I, we sat there with Josh and, and Francois. And I said, let's change this. Let's change that. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's put the, let's do some different things to the instrument. And uh, that's where it began really with Francois's uh, willingness to, uh, to uh, change some things. And eventually uh, we, when uh, the production of the instruments were moved from Paris to, to Germany, uh, Weston, Weston Sprott and I, we went to Germany and we had a couple of days of, again, tweaking the instrument, changing, changing a lot of different things about it. And eventually we came up with instruments that would, would work in our market and in our situation at the Metropolitan Opera. And, uh, we got Damien Austin, our, uh, uh, one of our principals on board at the time. And, you know, we, it was great at the, at the time before, before we did this, actually, we were all kind of playing on slightly different instruments and, I, you know, our, our section sound wasn't, wasn't homogenous in some ways. And, you know, us establishing this relationship with Courtois and developing instruments together, you know, it was, it was really great for our section sound, I would say. And eventually we, re we recorded an album that's out there somewhere. Uh, and we're very proud of that. I was going to say, I, I, I had my whole stack right here and I, and I had that one ready at the top, but I had, I had just packed it up, I think yesterday in, in my car. So I uh, reached down with nothing to grab. Um, <laughs> but, um, that, that's really, really cool. Uh, do you remember what that first instrument was that you tried based on, on you know, kind of what the models are today? Was it still that, that double Hagman bass trombone or was it something totally different than, than what you have now? As I remember, it, it was a double Hagman. Uh, mm -hmm. It had uh, some kind of sound plate in the tuning, the, the main tuning slide. And uh, it was he very heavily braced. And uh, of course that, plate of metal on the tuning slide made it heavy also so it was it was a very very heavy, heavy instrument it was kind of stiff and uh yeah and basically what we did to change we i mean we did a lot we did a lot to change it but uh we took off we rebraced it in in several ways we removed some of the bracing uh, we changed the, the 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 way the tuning slide uh tuning slides were uh designed uh uh, of course, we 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 started the cut bell uh, thing. Uh, I asked Josh to put because I was flying a lot at that time, and it was getting more and more difficult to fly with a bass trombone. And uh, I asked Josh to put a screw rim on the bell, and that that changed some of the ways it sounded. So uh, yeah, we did we did a lot to the instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, for for those that don't know, uh, these th these are all the all of these changes directly resulted in in. Paul's specific model, the, the New York creation bass trombone. And he, he mentioned Weston Sprout as well, who also has the, has the uh, tenor trombone, the, the New York creation tenor trombone, which both have the, the screw cut bell. Um, and a quick question here uh, in the comment section from Wendy St. John. Thank you for chiming in, Wendy. Uh, hello, when did you switch to bass bone? I switched to bass trombone. Uh, uh, well, it was kind of a slow fade into bass trombone, I have to say. Uh, I. Again, I mentioned my undergrad institution, Jacksonville State University in Jacksonville, Alabama. I got there as a music ed major, as a tenor trombone player. And uh, the jazz band at the time needed a bass trombone player. So, uh, and they had, they had a bass trombone there that I could check out. So I checked out the bass trombone, and it was during that time that I kind of started doubling. I was playing tenor trombone in the concert band and the wind ensemble and playing bass trombone in the jazz band. And, uh, and, I, you know, got pretty good at doubling, uh, I would say. And uh, the, the, the switch to mostly bass trombone happened after I completed my music ed degree. I make a long story short, I wound up with a Broadway show, a uh, touring Broadway show, an Andrew Lloyd Webber greatest hits kind of show. And uh, I was hired to play this show because uh, I was a doubler. I could play both instruments. But I got I got to the first rehearsal of the show, and it turned out that they had hired another tenor trombone player. So they they wanted a full section of trombones, so they had two tenors. So I became the bass trombone player only. Uh, 
And so I left my tenor behind and for the next two years uh, traveled the country, a different city each week with this show, playing only bass trombone. And one of the things that I did uh, during that time was took I whenever we'd land in the city, I would try to get in contact with some of the players in the city to have lessons and uh, only on bass trombone. And so that was kind of how I made the switch from being a doubler to, to really focusing on bass trombone and to eventually winning my job in the Met. And, you know, one of the really crazy things that happened once I got to New York, even though I took the audition on bass trombone and thought I was going there to be the bass trombonist of the Met, immediately when I got to New York, I realized that there was a real need for someone that, that could play both instruments in the Metropolitan Opera because there's, you know, opera, there's so many different uh, configurations of a trombone section depending on the opera, not to mention that many operas have a huge stage band and mm -hmm. There was a need for somebody that could be the switching player. In Germany, they call it the Vexel player, the switching player. So that that really quickly became my role in the Met. I became the guy that would that could play that would play any anything that was needed. Uh, eventually, was playing a lot of bass trumpet. Uh, recorded the Ring Cycle with the Met on bass trumpet. Uh, so you know my my early years of being a tenor trombone player and my years of learning how to play valves through stuff like drum corps and, and marching band really helped when I got to New York. And But to get back to the original question, I, I started playing bass trombone in the jazz band. By the way, my doctoral dissertation is on the history of the bass trombone in big band jazz. Uh, but uh, I started playing bass trombone in jazz band. Very cool. And so, uh, and another chiming in here, Aaron, Aaron uh, Valme chiming in saying, hey. Um, Aaron, how are you? Uh, it's always good to hear from Aaron. Um, so back to uh, back to a little bit more with the, the Courtois history. Um, something a lot of people, a lot of uh, trombone, trombonists may not realize is that. Uh, so we have the the new creation series, uh, the New York creation series with the cut bell that we introduced in May of 2018. Uh, but we also had a, a previous New York creation series which just had the straight bell the, without the cut. Um, what was it? And I know that there are a lot of there's a lot more that goes into it other than just the cut. Uh, what were the things that, uh, and you mentioned your, your meeting with Josh Landers about, about just getting the bell and uh, the screw on bell. Um, what were the other things that were that you wanted to change about the instrument or, or wanted to tweak? I know there's a lot to the to the bass specifically with the you know changes in the hand grip and then the tuning slide that that went into there. Again, the the instrument that I tried uh, originally in that show when the Courtois first opened up its showroom was really heavy and the sound was kind of. Uh, the, it was hard to project the sound and um, it was kind of hard to produce the sound on the instrument. Uh, I was, I was looking to design an instrument that was easy to play that had a beautiful warm sound, but, but was easy to play. And uh, so that was my, that was my, my first desire, something that sounded great would fit into the American market would be easy to produce a sound on, you know, we older players know that the older you get, the more important e ease is. You know, when you're when you're young and you're is strong, you're at your peak of strength. You know, you know you don't mind playing an instrument that's heavy or a, an instrument that you have to work a little bit to produce a great sound on. But as you get older, you want things to be easy. And uh, my instrument, you know the sound wants to speak on the instrument. You don't have to put a lot of energy uh, behind producing the sound and it comes out very, very easily. Uh, you know, the other thing, I, I forgot to mention this, I can't believe I didn't mention it, but the other thing I changed about the instrument was that we changed the intonation of the second valve. You know, uh, we gave it, uh, uh, the way it's designed is you can, you have the option of either playing a G or a G flat for the intonation of your second valve. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I like I like playing the G side of it. Uh, I I started experimenting with that after some lessons with Blair Bollinger uh, while I was on the road with that show that I mentioned. And I would go to Blair's house, and he was playing uh, he was playing an instrument that had a slightly flat G in first position, right? And uh, which I I tried for a long time, but it, it started to get frustrating because I could almost play a G in tune in first. And I started seeing all the ways in the solo and excerpt repertoire that that would be super uh, uh, convenient to have a G or a D in first position. So uh, 
Uh, I had them give me a G that was completely in tune in first position. I use that a lot. I use my second valve a lot. But uh, getting back to the, the cut bell, you know, having a cut bell uh, is – the convenience of having that, the convenience of having a case that's the size of a violin, uh, you know, for anybody that travels a lot with their instruments, the convenience of that uh, cannot be underestimated. You know, I've since since starting to travel with uh, uh, the cut bell case situation, I've never I have never had a problem with an airline, and I mean, I fly between Indianapolis and New York City you know, before COVID, I was sometimes making that trip three or four times a week on, on the smallest commuter jet you can, you can fly on. And I did not have a problem ever with, with that case. And, you know, I've had discussions with other players here and there about whether or not the sound changes once you cut the bell. And, you know, if the sound changes, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's inaudible, in my opinion. I've, you know, I, I, I also have a Courtois bell that's not cut. Uh, so I have, I have a couple of bells that are cut. I have a bell that is cut. And I've played them back-to-back -back for people. Uh, I've done lots of different playing uh, experiments to, to, to see if there is a, a negative side of using this cut bell. And for me, it's the, if there is a difference, it's, it's you know, practically inaudible. But the trade-off is... You, you can travel so conveniently. It's just for me a no-brainer. I will never go back to using a non-cut bell ever again. You know? <laughs> and, and you mentioned the case. Uh, what's a really cool little little fact about the, both of the horns actually is that they both come in the exact same case. Uh, you can find pictures of that case online. It, it's as, as, as he said, it is no bigger than a violin case. And, and I think you know I think it's pretty unique to have both the bass and the tenor coming in the exact same case. I think that's something really unique. Um, Actually, you know, uh, uh, if I'm pretty sure the tenor case is smaller than the bass case. The tenor case is even smaller. The you know, it was in the, the the bass case is is like a viola case, you know, and the tenor is like the violin case. I that just to be clear, just just to make that clear, <laughs> but very convenient, yeah. very con convenient to travel with. A quick chime in here. Uh, Daryl Burnett is asking, do you play on a Courtois mouthpiece or something else? Ah, good question. I, I do not play on the Courtois mouthpiece. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to Sun He and Ultimate Brass. I have a signature mouthpiece uh, through Ultimate Brass that was developed again just in time for the COVID outbreak. We, we'd been working on it this past year. And uh, so, yeah, I play on a, a, an uh, a mouthpiece designed by Son He and Ultimate Brass. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And Chris Coppinger is asking, can you please explain the, I, don't think, I think we touched on it a little bit, can you please explain the G, G flat removable tuning slide? Yeah, so uh, great question, Chris. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very special design. Uh, uh, the second valve, uh, has uh, has a little insert. If you want to play with a G flat valve, there's an insert, an extra set of tubing that you can put on top of the the the, the tubes that the valves come out. That will elongate the second valve and make it possible to have a G flat instead of the G. And I I don't have one here, unfortunately. I'm I'm here in my library slash studio here in Bloomington. I don't have one of those inserts, but. Uh, yeah, it's just an extra little bit of tubing that you can use to elongate the second valve and make it a G flat valve. Mm -hmm. Very, very easy to move in and out. And, and something else uh, some players might not be aware of is we uh, both the tenor and the bass are offered in a in a yellow brass and a, a rose brass bell configuration. Um, for for your for what you do, do you have one of both, or, or which one do you usually find yourself playing more of? I have the yellow brass. I play on the mm -hmm. yellow brass bell. And that's, that's, you know, it, you know, even though we're sitting here talking about instrument design and instruments, I'm actually not a, an equipment, uh, an equipment guy. I really don't change in equipment a lot. Uh, the mm -hmm. honest truth is I don't change lead pipes a lot. I, I'm not a person that's going to show up to, uh, you know, for instance, in, at the opera, you know, I, I mean, I could be playing Gluck one day and Wagner the second day, you know, 
and Strauss the next day, Verdi or Puccini the next day. So we're, we, we're playing music from a lot of different time periods, you know, a little bit like in the orchestra, you play Haydn one day, Beethoven the next day, Wagner the next day, you know, I'm not a person that's going to show up to the gig with a different instrument for the repertoire that I'm playing. I generally try to play, uh, everything that I play on, on one instrument. Hey, by the way, did you know that, uh, did you know that the original name for this instrument was going to be the New Yorker? Did you know that? I did. I did. Uh, <laughs> I think the, That's a uh, funny story. I think, uh, I, I originally, I actually remember, uh, because I, um, uh, I was at ITF uh, in 2018, which was just right after those instruments were, were introduced. And I remember every single time someone was up, this was the New Yorker, the New Yorker, the New Yorker, the New Yorker the whole time. And it was great. Um, and I actually think that's where uh, I met you for the first time after you, you played with the Army Field Band, I believe, which was a phenomenal concert. Um, which, was, which ITF was this? Uh, Iowa City in 2018. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Iowa City. Good. That was a good one. <laughs> my old stomping grounds. I haven't mentioned University of Iowa, uh, but that's that's where I went for my master's and doctorate. Studied with Dr. David Gear, who's now the a, a dean at University of Michigan, and studied with uh, George Krim, and uh, who uh, lives in Kansas now, I believe, and a guy named John Hill. But uh, some great. I had great days in Iowa. And I will be uh, getting there later today, so I'm looking very forward to that. Actually, into Iowa City, so I'm looking forward to that nice little drive down there. Um, so you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, kind of when we started, uh, you're, you're, you're changing up in practicing of what you're doing now with all this free time. You know, I think a lot of people, um, when, when they think of you, they think of, of your ability to practice and, and like you said, just make the most of your situation. Like you say, with the, the, the one instrument, you don't really change things up. It's really just getting, you know, getting the work out of it. Um, what have you been able to explore now with all this free time in, in your practicing? Well, uh, I've, uh, again, the, the, right at the beginning of, well, it's probably a month into the, the outbreak that, that complete one hour unaccompanied solo recital was, I'd never done that before. Honestly, I'd, I'd included an unaccompanied piece on, uh, recitals that I'd done in the past that included mostly pieces with piano, but never a complete unaccompanied recital. So that was, that was a really great thing to do. Uh, it's very different from playing uh, with a piano. It's, you know, no, first of all, the endurance challenge is there. There are no rests. You're sometimes playing five, six, seven, eight minutes uh, with, with no rest. So that, um, that was a real challenge and I was glad I did that. So, you know, the other thing I've been doing quite a bit during this time uh, is I'm in putting the finishing touches on, two new solo albums uh, that, again, back in, before the COVID outbreak, uh, and this is going to sound crazy, but it really is true. In, in recording sessions that happened between 10 and midnight on the campus of uh, the Jacobs School, uh, my pianist and I, Kim Carballo, we recorded two solo albums, one of uh, all new solo rep that I was a part of the commissioning process for, so the album is going to include uh, the Ver Helst uh, uh, on your own now, a new sonata by a guy named Chris Schmitz that's based on opera harmonies and themes, uh, uh, a piece called Bell Tonal by Anthony DiLorenzo that I was part of the commissioning process for, another piece uh, by uh, uh, Joe Buono called Elegy. It's going to include uh, that album's going to include those those pieces that I was involved with the uh, commissioning process. But the thing I'm even more excited about is uh, uh, again a new solo album bait that is comprised of all music from the French from uh, the French school of composition based around the Paris Conservatory that was uh, commissioned by a guy named Paul Bernard. Who uh, most, mo if you don't know who he is, you probably recognize the name because a lot of the French solos that we play as bass drum home players uh, are dedicated. It says uh, to my friend Paul Bernard at the top of it. Things like the 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 boats in New Orleans, uh, the Castoret uh, uh, Fantasy Concertante, plus a whole bunch of other repertoire that's really not played that much anymore. All dedicated to Paul Bernard. Paul Bernard was. Uh, uh, first of all, it was very difficult to find information. He's almost lost the history. You know, it was very difficult to find information on him. But he, he's a fascinating guy. He was the tubist. He was the tubist uh, in in one of the orchestras in Paris, 
But the Paris Conservatory, uh, I think it was 1951 or something. I remember the date off the top of my head. But early 1950s, they decided to add bass trombone to the uh, the the curriculum. They just the the the, the dean there decided to add uh, that that as uh, as an instrument that you could study at the conservatory, along with tuba and saxhorn. And Paul Bernard, by default, became the first bass trombone teacher in, in France. And uh, as a result of that, uh, because of their system there, was able to commission a lot of different, a lot of different composers to write solos for bass trombone. And uh, apparently was a real jokester, was a funny guy, and, uh, but uh, yeah, did a, did a lot for that instrument in, in France. And so this, the second album that I'm talking about will be dedicated to him, and it's all solo music that was commissioned by him and for him. That's awesome. Well, and I look very forward to, to, to hearing some of that stuff. Um, a couple of cool questions uh, uh, we have in the comments here from Bill Harris. Uh, speaking of lead pipes, what lead pipe comes with the, the Courtois bass trombone, and which one do you play? The one one lead, lead lead pipe comes with the instrument, and it it is uh, I don't know the exact length off the top of my head. I want to say it's probably it's probably 10, 10, 10 to fifteen inches. It's not you know. Early in my career, I actually won my first job uh, with playing an instrument with no lead pipe. I had just I had just uh, come out of playing in the Chicago Civic Orchestra, studying with Charlie Vernon, drinking the Kool Aid of uh, big mouthpiece, no lead pipe, and won my first job in the Hong Kong Philharmonic, my first full time job on that that setup. But uh, you know, pretty soon after getting winning that job and actually playing full time with tenor trombone players, I realized that setup was not great for blending and matching what they were doing. So slowly over over time, I went from no lead pipe to a lead pipe that's actually quite long. Uh, to it, you know, what I realized is that the that makes the clarity of articulation a lot easier, and it also helps me again just match what the tenors are doing. So uh, to get back to Bill's, hello, Bill, by the way, that uh, to answer your question, uh, it comes with one lead pipe and it's, it's, uh, I don't know the length off the top of my head. <laughs> and then uh, another one from Francois, actually. Hello, Paul, great to see you. Um, Good question, to see you, Francois. What is the advantage of the Hagman valve versus others like the, the Thayer or the traditional rotor? You know, I love, uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, I started on a traditional rotor instrument. I played on uh, Thayer's for many years. I I won a couple of different jobs with Thayer's, and I never really played on a Hagman valve and, until my relationship with Courtois. But uh, what I realized was that it, it, it is so uh, – the Hagman valves allow you to play with such fluidity and ease. There, there's nothing heavy. There's nothing cumbersome about them, and, uh, you know uh, – your ability to play fast and fluidly is just it, it's just better in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to do this here. Uh, you know, something like uh, I have my instrument here. That kind of fluidity happens with such ease on a Hagman valve, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's for me, that's the main, the main strength of the valve. It's, it's not heavy. It move, it has very quick action and you can just, you know, play virtuosically and with, with, uh, without a lot of effort. And, uh, Renee Hagman, I love Renee Hagman. He's, he's a crazy genius in my, uh, you know, in my, when I've met him in different places around the world, he always has something, something for me to try or some different thing on the instrument that he's thought about. So he's, uh, the, the, he, he did a great service to the trombone world by in, inventing these valves. I couldn't agree more. And, and, and a lot of people, uh, I think when they think of Courtois, especially uh, in the United States, they think about that, that Hagman valve relation to the instruments. Um, for those that don't know the, the partnership between Renee Hagman and, and Hagman valve and, and Courtois is, a, is very, very, historic and and so the relationship between that valve and the rest of the instrument is so is so concrete and so strong that, that those ones always stand out and and uh 
I always like to at, at bigger shows like Midwest or, or, or you know, NAM, there's, there's always the opportunity to, to, to teach a young kid about what the Hagman valve is because a lot of times they, they may be seeing it for the first time and it's always really fun to, to see their, their first, you know, the, that, that face they make when they first get to feel what the instrument is like and it's a lot of fun. Um, by the way, let me say uh, another thing people don't realize about this company that I, I'm fascinated by and I love is that it's the oldest instrument maker in the world. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it means a lot to me to know that I'm playing an instrument that, that takes its lineage all the way back to the Napoleonic times. Uh, so, yeah, very, that's interesting for me. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned that, uh, for everybody ch tuning in, uh, officially Courtois was was started in 1803, but we have clear documentation of, of instrument production well well before that. So uh, as, as he mentioned, there's there's a lot of history there. It's really fun to, to go into that. And and I encourage everybody uh, watching right now to, to kind of do a little bit of research, go online, uh, Google Anton Courtois and, and see about uh, his relationship, not only uh, with instrument manufacturing, but but with Napoleon himself, uh, as he was, he was listed by Napoleon himself to build instruments. I also want to say uh, another thing that I, I love about this instrument is that uh, it is truly, and I, I, I mentioned this in a recital that I did at the showroom, uh, I think last year, this is truly an international collaboration, this instrument, you know. Uh, first of all, the, the origins of the company are in, in Paris, in France. It has uh, Courtois stamped, stamped on there, but it also has Made in Germany stamped on there with the uh, with a collaboration with a, a company that has a, a long history of making instruments at a very high level. And it's, it's, it's made for someone that plays in New York in America. So it, it, you know, the, these, these New York model instruments are truly uh, an international collaboration in their design. And in, in, it's, it's very special. I, I love that about the instruments. That's awesome. And uh, a couple more questions here. One, uh, one from Chris Covinger. How do you fit your mouthpiece with the new beard? <laughs> well, uh, it, it's it. The, there's not a problem there. You know, <laughs> I've been asked. I've been asked if I if I joined a Leonard Skinner cover band uh, <laughs> during during COVID, and uh, that, that that was a good one. You know, I you can't. I can't get. A, I haven't been able to get a haircut for two months, and uh, I've never liked. I've really never really liked shaving. So I thought this is my chance. This is my <laughs> chance to just let it go. And just see what happens here, and that's what I've been doing. Good question, Chris. I bet you've got a, I bet you've got a big, uh, a big fluffy red beard right now. I bet. <laughs> uh, that's that's thanks, Chris. Uh, and and from Wade Demer Demerit, I'm sorry if I'm I'm butchering that a little Hi, bit. Hi, Wade. Wade's in Alaska. Very cool. What is the most beneficial exercise you play every day? Whoa, the most beneficial exercise I play every day. Oh. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that I do every day, but, you know, if, if I could point to the one thing that I have done for decades now that I would say has helped my playing overall, it's playing a, a, a Bordoni etude in different, with different uh, transpositions, you know, uh, going all the way back again to my undergrad days with my teacher who first introduced me to this idea of playing, playing a melody uh, in tenor clef playing it down an octave, playing it dinner cleft down two octaves, playing it in tenor down, cleft down three octaves, playing it up an octave. That's the thing that I do. That That's my go-to every day. I do that. And uh, it just allows me to, it allows me to, to touch every, every perfect fourth of my range basically. And uh, depending on the, the, the key of the etude, I, I'll sometimes do a Bordoni seven or eight different ways. Uh, I think I have, I have a video of one of, uh, of, of a Bordoni playing it seven or eight ways uh, as an example of how to do that. And it's just a really great way to, to visit every little, every little floor of your sound every day and just make sure that it's warm and beautiful and in tune. So that's, that's my go-to. But, you know, during COVID, I've, I've had a chance to explore a lot of different books uh, that I had never worked out of, honestly. Uh, I've played through the the Brad Edwards Lipsler book probably three or four times the entire book back to back during, during the outbreak, the Barbez, uh, another, uh, great book from the, the French output. Um, 
I've done quite a bit of that. The Beach, the bass trombone version of the Beach Etude book, I've been doing that. I have a, I have a stack of four books that I'm kind of working through during this virus. Uh, my family and I, at the very beginning, when uh, when it was obvious that we weren't going to be able to leave, we just we had a meeting and we said, you know what, our goal at by the end of this is to be better than we were at the beginning. And so that I'm definitely trying to do that on the trombone, trying to learn some different etudes. But uh, Bordoni is something I still do every day. There's, a, there's nothing better than, than waking up to do a Bordoni, that's for sure. Um, Francois chiming in again, I still have not had a haircut for a month either, and I still do not have anything on my head. So <laughs> Sorry about that, Francois. <laughs> and then Genetics, I baby. Genetics. <laughs> Uh, a couple questions too. Uh, and I apologize if I'm going to butcher this name. Philip Pawan Gunderson. Uh, hello, Paul. What are your thoughts about dual bore versus single bore bass from bones? Both 547, 562, and 562, 578 dual bores. Wow, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I. Uh, Every bass trombone I've ever played has been a dual bore instrument, a dual bore slide, meaning that one slide, uh, well, really what it means is that the instrument is continually getting more wide from the mouthpiece to the bell. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what's comfortable for me. That's, that's the setup that allows me to, uh, uh, to play with a warm sound, to play with a sound that blends a bit with the tuba, but also blends a bit with the, with the tenors, uh, I do know of some players that have that have that have started bass trombone at a very high level, in the highest of levels, on on a single bore uh, bass trombone, but eventually have moved to bass trombone because again, I, I, I'm sorry, have moved to the dual bore because again, it's just a way that allows you to blend with the tuba when you need to, but also blend with the tenors. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm a fan of the 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 dual bore instrument and. I don't know if we're going to get this question or not, but I'm also a, a fan of uh, independent valves. You know, uh, I've, I've never played a dependent system, but I love the fact that I can use either one of my valves independently, depending mm -hmm. on what I need for a particular musical moment. And then uh, another good one from Jason Kong. Uh, another Jason other... in Hong Kong. Hello, Jason. Uh, another... Hey, by the way, look, Jason, look behind me. You see that picture, Jay, that this picture right here? Can you see that? It's a little bit of a glare, but I can see kind of the sides of it. Jason Kong took that. That's a photo that Jason Kong won an International Photography Award for micro, micro for photography in the ocean. And he won that award and had it blown up and framed for me. And I have it in my library here in Bloomington. Good, good to hear from you, Jason. Uh, his question is single radius and double radius for tuning slides. Your thoughts? Uh, the honest truth is, I really haven't experimented with with those. I don't think that that's I don't think that's really an option with Courtois, right? We don't we don't really offer that. Uh, I don't even know is my is my instrument a single or a double radius? I have no idea. Uh, it should be single. Um, yeah, there's not a ton we do with with uh, you the know, shape of the tuning slide. Yeah, you know, it's not like when we see a lot of other modular companies where, where you have so many interchangeable tuning slides and different things like that, where uh, one of the kind of Courtois mentality thoughts is that everything, you know, we like to have it as an outfit, not necessarily like a, a Lego set. But, uh, and Jason says, I see that with a, with a nice little, little smile in there. So very cool. I miss you, man. I hope, you're, hope your family's well. And then just checking the comments here a little bit more. Dan Morris chiming in saying uh, 551 players. In Hi, the Dan. Woo. Uh, any other? Uh, looks like uh, we've had Stephen Wimple joined in. Hey, Stephen. Uh, John DeCesar, Dan Morris has said, and Patricio Constantino. So hi, everybody. Thanks for all joining in. Uh, and and uh, I think we're, we're getting close to the, to the wrap-up period here. So if anybody has any last-second questions, please chime in here. Um, uh, I just want to thank you again so much for being here and, and doing this today. You know, I, I as uh, much of this is a, a, a bummer situation, I think there's a lot of optimism in you about making the best of the situation. And, and that's really, really refreshing to hear um, with, with every time you turn on the news, it's just something, you know, another upsetting part of this whole situation. 
Yeah, you know, I again, uh, I have a family, and uh, one of the things that we're really trying to dwell on is that we, in the, for the rest of our lives, there may never be another time where we are together, uh, full time, uh, getting getting to know each each other better, uh, spending time with each other, and you know, I'm probably never going to have another time in my life where I can just have regular practice completely uninterrupted by job, by responsibilities on a daily basis like this. So I'm, I'm trying to look at the situation as a uh, uh, glass half full instead of half empty, for sure. Fantastic. And actually another one from, from Bill Harris here. Uh, <laughs> I, I think this one is a more serious than Chris's originally, but uh, another beard question actually. Uh, here, <laughs> do you recommend hair or no hair on the lower lip where the bottom, uh, where the bottom mouthpiece rests? I have a partial Van Dyke beard and share the upper lip in a sort of reversed V. Like, uh, you know, I I find it un it's uncomfortable for me to actually have uh, have hair touching where my lips are vibrating. Honestly, and I'm I'm a mostly I'm, I play mostly with the top lip, as you can see. So I try to I actually try to keep that kind of shaved. I I try not to play on top of of facial hair. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another one from, from Matt Vance, who's our, our woodwind product specialist. Uh, are you are you able to still are you able to still do any big band slash large jazz ensemble playing? Uh, what are your some what uh, excuse me? What are some of your favorite big band charts for bass trombone? Oh my gosh, good question, man. I'm gonna have to think about this a little bit. You know, uh, well, first of all, let me say not a, not a lot of not a lot of big band playing in my life uh, for the past decade. You know, when you're when you're a when you're a member of the Metropolitan Opera, opera, you're getting opera poured on top of your head all day, every day. There's there's not a lot of opportunity to do other things, uh, which again is kind of shocking because, uh, I mean, I was the I was the the jazz I was the jazz TA at the University of Iowa at one point. I conducted their I conducted their jazz band, you know, one of their jazz bands. John Rapson worked with a guy named John Rapson, who was the director of jazz there. I, the, the show that I mentioned, the Andrew Lloyd Webber show that I played in, uh, was, they were all jazz musicians. So I was surrounded by people that had, uh, toured with Buddy Rich and Woody Herman and Stan Kenton, uh, in, with an augmented string section. Um, so previous, previous to the orchestra thing starting to take off, I was really into jazz, but n it, almost zero of that. Now, the closest I ever get to that at this point is a recording session here, or there in New York city will be kind of a. A commercial style uh, recording session, but some of my my favorite tunes for for, uh, for uh, in, in the jazz band world, you know, anything by the Mingus Big Band, you know, uh, the, everything that was written with uh, Dave Taylor in mind. I, I used to love to play those charts and, and uh, program those charts in my big band. Uh, Stan Kenton, uh, some of the Stan Kenton charts with double bass trombone, they're real they're really fun uh, and. Uh, Interestingly, I, from a guy named Tom Matta, who's based in Chicago, I just bought I, I bought a copy of every one of his big band charts that feature a bass trombone solo, uh, which uh, they were all composed and dedicated to Charlie Vernon. He he made an album called Eight Minutes to the Loop that had several charts with uh, with trombone solo and big band. And I've just purchased all of those charts and. At some point, I'd like to do a full recital with big band and and bass trombone, but uh, oh, uh, probably one of my favorite tunes to listen to uh, for big band and bass trombone is the uh, the, the Teen Town uh, that uh, Weather Report recorded a, 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 a chart called Teen Town with Jaco Pastorius. John Fedchuk made an arrangement of that chart for bass trombone, featuring George Flynn on bass trombone. That is that's one of my favorite charts, honestly. If you guys don't know that album, go check it out. John Fedchuk, the uh, God, what's the name of the album? Well, anyway, it's the the cut is Teen Town with George Flynn playing a Jaco Pastorius solo line on bass trombone. It's awesome. That's awesome. That's that's really cool. And now I look forward to to plugging into the car when I'm on my drive. So that's awesome. Dude, it's it is it's a, it's a fun it's a fun album. Thank you so much. And then uh, Bill Harris coming in again. George Roberts playing "Making Whoopsie." Oop, excuse me, "Making Whoopie." Love that recording and and 
Les Elgar has a lot of tasty bass from bone charts. And Matt, thanking you for, for your answer right there. Uh, and, and Francois chiming in, thanks a lot for your support, Paul. You are awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you, Declan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're coming up on the hour now, so it'll be a good time to, to sign off. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Uh, and, and thank you for, again for, for doing the, the Paris showroom concert. Thank you for being here today and, and spending time with us. And, and uh, as much as I look forward to things getting back to normal, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're enjoying this now, this newfound at home time. Thank you so much. Hey, please drive safely. And I'm sure I'll see you in person at some point. Look forward to it. All right, take care. All right, everybody. Au revoir. <laughs>